Thank you to everybody who came all the way upstairs for this. I do appreciate it. I almost didn't want to come this far. So um, welcome. We're going to try to make this fun. This is a very, look at this. Everybody shows up now, just now. Um, this is a heavily technical talk, but we're going to try to make it as light as possible. So you are here to learn about Kafka. I'm sorry, but this is also a Tolkien talk, so I hope any of you got the references. Um, there's just going to be so many more of them, so let's enjoy it. We're here to learn, effectively, more or less, how to get data into Kafka, right? How many of you use Kafka? How many of you currently, uh, how many of you operate Kafka, but don't necessarily write applications on it? OK. All right, we've got some split in there. So I'm going to teach all of you who currently use Kafka, write applications, how to actually get this data in, and some of the, the, the fun nuances, right? Because how many of you who build applications sort of treat the Kafka client API as just a black box? Yeah, I'm so guilty of it. And it's so nice. It's a beautiful little black box that you can just call producer send, consumer pull, and you just move on with your life, right? It just works. And that's good. Nine times out of 10, it just works. So uh, we're going to talk about how to actually handle that one time out of 10 and what you can do. And hopefully, uh, this is going to be more of an awareness talk. All right, great. So we want to get data into Kafka. So I'm going to start with some best practices. And we're going to create a schema, OK? I'm so sorry if you don't like schemas, if you just want to like go wild. But I really like schemas. Um, and again, this is a Tolkien talk. So we have a very, very serious schema about Hobbit updates. So what do we need to know? We need to know the name of the Hobbit that we're dealing with, where this Hobbit might be currently, and what they're currently doing. They don't do a lot of different things, so I just kind of limited it to, to the main Hobbit activities. So we have a schema. We need a corresponding topic. So we're going to call it Hobbit Updates. And we'll get into a lot of these configurations later as they apply to getting this data into Kafka, but I wanted to highlight some of them here. So we have the number of partitions. Remember, Kafka is a distributed system, so we want to store the data on different areas uh, of the cluster, so we break it up into partitions. We have replication factor, how many copies of each of those partitions we should have. Min in sync replicas relates to that as well, so when we are copying this data, how many of those copies should be up to date for us to consider the cluster healthy? And then cleanup policy. So when data is stale, either old or otherwise, how do we get rid of it? All right, so keep those in the back of your mind. We're going to reference a lot of those later. So we have a schema. We have a topic. Let's write data into Kafka. And that's easy. We all know how to do that, right? We, you don't know how to do that? Welcome. Well, you're going to call producer.send. OK. That's basically what you're going to do. You're done. You can leave now. That's it. Um, so we're going to write some data. Um, and in a lot of cases, it depends on what uh, language you're actually writing your client in. But effectively, you're going to build up some sort of object or string or some representation of the data you want to move into Kafka. Um, we're going to be smart. We're going to assign a key here as well. And we're just going to key it by the Hobbit in question. So we've got Bilbo. We're keying it by that. He is currently in bag end in Hobbiton where he should be, and he's eating. It's, um, it's 2 o'clock now, so that's, what, four, five meals in? All right, so he's doing pretty well. And we're going to take this data. We're going to call producer.send. We want to get it into Kafka. All right? So for those of you, I'm so sorry, I'm going to give you an update, you know, a quick intro later. But uh, for those of you who do do this very frequently, that data's in Kafka, right? The data's in Kafka, right? Probably. Yeah, um, I'm, not here to, I'm not here to try to scare you, right? For all intents and purposes, when you call producer.send, that data is on its way. And it's that beautiful black box, so you don't really have to think or worry about it not being there in most cases. But how it actually gets there and the different stages it goes through, how long that takes, there's a lot of things that actually go into play and affect how that happened. It's a, it's a pretty long story, OK? And the great thing is, is that it is abstracted away from you. You don't have to think about these when it works, right? But every time you call this, in order for that data to make it onto disk, there are, we go on a journey. It is an epic, OK? So we're going to go through all of these stages. Yes, I like that look on your face. And that's, I want you to keep that sense of wonder forever if you start using Kafka, OK? Because we should appreciate this process. All right, so we have our producer client. We call producer.send. And that data is being shipped off. Disk is all the way over to the right there. And we've got to come back and tell that producer whether or not we've succeeded. OK, this is going to happen more or less every time you want to get data into Kafka. OK? And we're going to break these down. Don't worry. But 
even though this, this diagram is very heavy on the right where we get into the broker, this, the colors are a little shifted. But basically, we have the producer client, we have everything else is happening on the broker. But it may not surprise you to hear that most of this process actually happens on the producer client. Okay? There's a lot of stages that we go through to actually prepare the data before we can move it onto the broker exactly. Okay? And this makes sense, right? We're dealing with hobbits, specifically Bilbo. He's a stubborn boy. Okay? If we're telling him to go on a journey, well, he's got to prepare. We have to convince him. Um, and all of this is going to happen back in Hobbiton and back end on the producer client. So let's try to convince Bilbo to leave. Okay? So within the producer client, first we started with this event, right? We've called producer.send, we want to issue that event and write it into Kafka. Well, the first step is to translate that event into something that the broker can work with. So again, depending on your implementation, this could be just a JSON string, this could be a raw string, this could be um, you know, an, any sort of object, we need to get it into Kafka. These brokers speak in raw bytes. Okay, so the first thing is that we need to serialize the data. And the whole point of this talk is for me to give you all of the configurations and most of the metrics that you will use to change, affect each of these stages, and monitor them. So at this point, when we're serializing, you have two options. We're going to serialize the key, or we can serialize the value. Right? Um, and so since we have an Avro schema that we built up, we're going to serialize that accordingly. Okay? All right. So we take that object, we serialize it, we have some raw bytes. Great, let's send it to Kafka. Well, not so soon. Now we have to deal with where we send it in Kafka, right? Because we need to determine the partition of that message. Now, there's a lot of configurations that actually go into play that affect how we partition our data and where we'll partition it. Um, most of this comes into play when you don't already determine a partition. So you're, you're fine in your producer clients to assign your own partition to the data as you write it. Okay? But in the event that you don't, we're going to deal with a couple of these configs. So the biggest one is partitioner class. And this is at a high level. It's going to tell you how we're just going to partition this data. Okay? And you have a few options. So if we don't set this, if it's none, which is completely valid, we're going to use the default partitioning logic. And follow me here. So if for the default partitioning, partitioning logic, if no partition is specified, but we have a key, and you'll remember we did for this event, then we're going to choose a partition based on the hash of that key. And that's really, really good because, well, that ensures that data with the same key is always going to be hashed to that same value, and it's going to be sent to the same partition. right? Great, so you're going to group that data. If no partition is set, and there's also no key, which is completely fine, you can do that, we're going to use something called the sticky partitioner. And what this means is that we're going to group a bunch of data together, and we're going to send it to one partition. And we're going to group the next thing and send it to the next partition. And the whole point of the sticky partitioner is to evenly distribute that data in the event that we don't have keys. Okay? That's really good for when we're processing later on, when we want to consume that data. Um, and be able to parallelize that processing. OK, so that's the default partitioning logic. Um, we could also use something called the round robin partitioner. And for those of you who have worked with Kafka, you might know that there are some poorly named metrics, poorly named configurations. So I really want to call it the ones that did it well. So round robin partitioner is exactly what it sounds like. Okay, uh, We're going to take an event uh, for every consecutive um, a series of events. We're going to take the first one, send it to partition 0. The next one, partition one, partition two, partition three, keep going on and on and on. And you would think that that would evenly distribute your data. But we have the sticky partitioner, so that means that the round robin partitioner didn't quite do it right. Okay, so keep that in mind if you're using that partitioner. Um, it doesn't always result in evenly distributed data. Okay, so um, just keep it in mind. And finally, your other option is to implement a custom partitioner. So this is for those advanced use cases. I feel usually in financial services, I feel it come up, um, where you know how your data looks, you know how it's distributed for a key, and you really want to ensure that you're not bogging down any one broker or any one partition. You want to avoid hot partitions. And so you can implement a custom partitioner just to make sure that it is actually uniformly distributed. Okay? And again, that's just if you really know how your data looks and you want to control that. All right. Other configurations that come into play. So. Um, this is a cool one. I enjoy it. Partitioner ignore keys. Again, exactly what it sounds like. Um, if true, the keys are ignored. If false, we use them. Great. Um, if you really, really want your data to be uniformly distributed, but you still want to have a key associated with that message, then you should use the default partitioner, right? set it to none, and then set partitioner ignore keys to true. 
Okay. A few other lesser known configurations, um, but cool ones nonetheless. Partitioner adaptive partitioning enable. We just really like to tack on more words here. It's basically German. It's fun, right? Um, so what this one says is it looks at the current set of brokers that we're sending data to, and it adapts to send that data to faster brokers. Right? Um, if we're trying to distribute this data and we just want to make sure that it ends up on a broker quickly, then um, this is a good option. We're going to ignore those slow brokers. We're going to send more data to the faster ones. In conjunction with that, we have our partitioner availability timeout MS. So if a request to send data to a given partition takes longer than this timeout, then we're going to ignore that partition for a while. We're going to say, eh, it's slow. We don't want to bog it down even more. OK. So that's partitioning. Great. So now we have some raw bytes, right? We've serialized our message. We've decided on a partition based on that key in this case. We should be si fine to send it off to the broker now, right? I'm watching you. OK. Um, well, sure, we could just send that piece of data off to the brokers. That would be completely fine. But it would probably be a little more efficient if we grouped some data together first and then went to the trouble of that round trip call to send it off to the broker, right? Um, usually, this idea of batching data is better for throughput, better for latency. Um, and so we can group data together based on its destination broker. There may be many partitions worth of data that we want to send at once, but the whole idea is that we're going to make a request with, uh, to a single broker with a lot of data. Okay? And batching, how many of you are batching? Do you know if you're batching? Okay. You don't know. We'll, we'll find out. Okay. We'll walk through it, don't worry. Um, so batching, I feel like when I talk to people and we're trying to debug some client issues on the producer side, Nine times out of ten, it has to deal with batching and how we uh, how we messed it up because you know it's not always completely obvious how to do batching well. Okay, um, because there are so many configurations that actually affect how your batches are built up, how you send them, and they're all going to interact with one another. So as soon as you start pulling one lever, ten others are affected. Okay, so you have to be smart about how you choose values for your batches, how you configure them. So the most obvious thing you would want to control when you start batching is, well, how big that batch should be, right? So we have batch.size. Again, it's what it sounds like. So keep in mind that for a given batch, that data is only destined for a single topic partition on a single broker, OK? So the default here is about 16 kilobytes. And there are a few things that you should keep in mind when you start working with, you know, playing around with batch size. So if your records are larger than this, which is completely possible, then obviously you're not going to batch, right? We're going to take a single record, we're going to send it, move on with our lives. Okay, so you should know what your data looks like before you start playing around with batching. Okay, please do yourself a favor. Um, if batch size is set to zero, then batching is disabled, right? We're just going to keep sending that data one by one. If batch size is small, then you're going to have more frequent sets of smaller batches sent to Kafka. And this could mean that throughput may go down. It may not, depending on your data, but it might go down. And this is because we're adding that round trip time to actually make that request and send it off to the broker. Okay? On the other hand, if batch size is large, um, you could potentially increase throughput, potentially, not always, but potentially. Um, but you also run the risk of other things, like maybe running out of space on the client okay? while, you, while you build up that batch. All right. And keep in mind that batch size is really just an upper bound, this configuration value. Okay? We also have a time component that affects the cutoff for when we try to add more data to the batch, and that is with linger MS. Okay? Linger MS is set to zero by default, meaning that we're not going to wait at all and we're not batching. Right? We're not going to try to fill, uh, wait for more data to fill up that batch before we send it. If you are trying to batch your data for better throughput, Know that as soon as you start playing around with LingerMS, you are doing it at the expense of added latency. Okay? Whatever you set LingerMS to, you are potentially adding that much latency to every, every call, every round trip call to Kafka. Okay? That said, this could also um, actually improve your latency by reducing pressure on the brokers. Right? You're going to make fewer calls to the broker. So batch size and linger MS, they go hand in hand. It's a beautiful little dance of playing around with them to try to optimize for your batch sizes. Um, so when we batch data, we are going to treat both of these as an upper bound, right? Batch.size is the upper bound on how much data we're going to try to send, and linger MS on how long we're going to wait to try to send that data. As we're trying to batch, 
the most often ignored configuration, I think, is buffer memory. Okay? As we're building up a batch of data, right, we're hanging out on the producer trying to build up this batch, that data has to go somewhere, and it's going to stay on the producer. And where is it going to go? Right in memory. Okay? So buffer memory, um, we have to allocate a chunk of memory for this data to be stored on, on the producer while we're building up the batch. Okay? Default is 32 megabytes. Know that the producer also uses some additional memory on top of this for other activities, which will come up later, so keep that in mind. Obviously, if you're playing around with buffer memory, it needs to be larger than the batch size. So if you play around with batch size and you make it larger than 32 megabytes, great. Well, you're going to run out of memory. You're going to have other issues, okay? So keep that in mind. Um, another thing to note is that when we first start up this producer, we have our buffer.memory configuration set. It's going to allocate that chunk of memory, and it's going to take that chunk of memory and break it up into batch.size sized chunks. Okay? So already, when you set this, you're kind of predetermining how many batches you could try to build up at once. Okay? Um, so this, this value is directly going to affect how many batches you could you can make in parallel. And like I said, playing around with batching, this is a dance. Uh, there's a lot of good you can do at this level when you want to actually optimize for this. There's a lot of bad that you can do if you don't do it properly. So you really need to keep track of how well your batches are performing. And how do we do that? Well, metrics. Wow, great. Um, Kafka uses the JMX metrics reporter by default. Um, so you just plug it in with any sort of uh, observability platform that you want. And yeah, take a look at these wonderful, wonderful metrics. So the first thing you'd want to keep track of at this point is the batch size, right? So we've got batch size average. This is a great sanity check to, to reaffirm that you are actually batching, that you're grouping data accordingly. If batch size average is consistently lower than what you've configured for batch size, then it might be the case that Linger MS is too low, right? We're not actually waiting long enough to build up a batch. We're cutting that off. At the same time, if Linger MS is already high and you're still not reaching batch size, well, then you're adding unnecessary latency, right? You're waiting for Linger MS to fully pass, and you're still not getting enough data to actually bring you close enough to batch size. All right, so you want to play, play around with that and keep track of it. Next, we have records per request average, what it sounds like, um, the average number of records per request. Again, this is a good sanity check if you just want to make sure you are batching. Then we have record size average, understanding what your data looks like. Right? You may be assuming that you have small records being produced into Kafka, but maybe we just got some rogue client that's producing insanely large records. You want to keep track of that. Next, we have buffer available bytes. Again, we want to keep track of how much memory we're actually taking up on the producer while we're waiting to build up these batches. This is really actually quite important. So if you're building up batches in parallel and we're trying to send them off to Kafka, we're not going to deallocate that segment within buffer memory until that producer actually receives an acknowledgment that that data has been successfully stored. Okay? So you can't actually, you're limited to that many batches being built in parallel. And then we have record queue time average. I haven't mentioned queues yet, but as we're building up these batches within buffer memory, um, we're effectively creating a queue of those records. And so this is between calling producer.send, which is when that record is actually stored in that segment on buffer memory, and when that data is actually sent along to the broker finally, uh, this is that value. Okay? So if you want to keep track of how long that data is hanging around on the producer, this is what you want to keep track of. OK, so those are batching metrics. Wonderful. Play around with it. I, I encourage you to. Batching is really cool. But OK, so now we have serialized our data. We have given it a partition. We have optionally batched it. Um, next, we have another optional step. We could compress that data. Um, this is one of those processes on the producer that actually does take up a little bit more space in memory, um, in addition to what's allocated by buffer memory. So you want to keep that in mind. By default, compression is disabled. but if you want to play around with it, it's controlled by the compression.type configuration parameter. We have a lot of uh, compression options available out of the box. If you want to play around with it, maybe use the Z standard as a starting point. But check the docs for more information. Again, it's optional. You don't necessarily have to do this. Cool. And now we can make the request. Finally, OK? Um, so at this point, we have, uh, the, well, first of all, let me go back. The reason you might want to actually compress is because any chunk of data that we put into a batch is going to be stored in the same spot you know, together in sequence uh, on disk, OK? So by compressing it, we're just reducing that. We're making it, those are all going to be stored in the same area when we actually store it on disk. So now we can make that request, right? 
We potentially have um, our batched records. We might have multiple batches grouped by where its destination broker. But the bottom line is that we have some data that's destined for the same broker, and we want to get that data on there. Okay? And we're going to do this with a request. So every producer maintains some socket connections with the brokers on the Kafka cluster, and they're going to send these requests using binary protocol over TCP. Okay? So it's request response. Keep that in mind. We, our producer is making a request to the broker to store this data, and the broker, in, in turn, is going to issue a response saying, all right, has this been stored or not? OK? Depending on how you configure things, your producer can actually wait you know, for a successful response before it moves on. You can make it sort of synchronous. Um, but usually, the producer is just going to move. It's going to issue that request and move on. So it's this request process that actually kicks off the first true phase of the journey. Right now, we can leave bag end. We can actually go on this journey. Um, before you get ahead of yourself, there are some configurations that affect how this happens from the producer side of things. So. We're still, we're still here. OK. So how do we affect uh, requests on the producer side? Well, the first thing is going to be with max request size. The default is about one megabyte. This is going to directly limit how many batches we can send at once within a given request. Keep in mind that the brokers also have a limit on how much data they can receive at once for a given request. And this is where compression would come in handy. OK? Next, we have acts, or acknowledgments. This is really, really important, and this is going to control a lot of the process moving forward. So for high availability and for fault tolerance in Kafka, you can optionally configure your topic partitions to have replicas. All right. So the data is initially produced to a lead, or lead replica, lead copy, uh, sort of the golden copy. And then it's copied over to any number of replicas across the cluster. So AX answers the question, how many replicas should we write to successfully before we send an OK response back to the producer? The default is all of them, right? That makes sense. We would like to make sure our data is stored where it should be. But you can totally throw caution to the wind and set this to 0 or 1 if you're feeling wild. I'm not going to tell you no. So, But know, know, know what you're doing, please. Um, next, we have max in-flight re in -flight requests per connection, getting back to those long ones. So producers are going to maintain connections to all the brokers they need to in order to send that data successfully, um, you know, depending on where these topic re partitions reside. But we don't want to inundate the request queue on a given broker. So we're going to set a limit. And so this is per connection, so effectively per broker. How many requests can we have in flight for that broker? And as you can imagine, this is going to impact things like um, item potency and you know, the ordering of your data. So keep in mind. Speaking of item potency, so we also have two very important configs here. We have enable item potency and transactional ID. So when item potency is enabled, we're going to enforce that acts equals all, that we have retries enabled. If something fails, we can retry. Um, and then we also set max in flight requests per connection to one with enabled item potency. So if you really want to ensure that all of your messages are stored once on the broker, um, even in the event of a producer failure, um, you want to also set the transactional ID. So enable item potency is only good within a single producer session. As soon as that producer goes down, then all bets are off as far as item potency, unless you use a transactional ID associated with that client. Okay? So that will enable item potency across producer sessions. And finally, we have request timeout MS. So once a request is actually sent to the broker, this is the maximum amount of time that that producer will wait before optionally retrying, if your retries are enabled, um, or throwing an exception. And retries themselves are handled by a couple of, of configurations. So we have the back off um, and the retries being enabled as well. OK. And the rest of the metrics we're going to go through on this talk are going to be related to the requests themselves. But I wanted to cover a few metrics that actually do tie back to these configurations we just covered. First, we have request rate. So this generally just describes the number of requests that are being made per second by this individual producer. Okay? Then we have requests in flight. So this is, again, a per producer metric that describes the number of requests that are currently being issued, um, waiting to be filled fulfilled by the brokers. You can use this to sort of see how bogged down your, your brokers actually are, how quickly they're responding to things. Ideally, you'd want this value to be low to show that your brokers are responding quickly. And finally, we have request latency average. So once the requests are issued to the broker, a timer starts. 
and this timer does not stop until the producer receives a response from that request. Okay, so this metric is that time. Okay, now we're gonna get off to the broker, right? We have issued our request. Let's actually see what this request looks like. I gotta darken these colors. Okay, can everyone see this? So we have, I wanted to cover quickly because um, there's a lot of nested structures here. So this is a sample producer request. Okay, so this of course is bound by the max request size that we have set on the producer. We first have some additional metadata that we're going to send along with this request. So that's going to have the transactional ID if you've decided to set it for item potency. We have acts, and then we also have the timeout that will be associated with this request. And then we have the actual payload of producer data that's being sent. And so it isn't just data for one topic. A batch will be for a specific topic destined for a specific, um, um, for a given partition for a specific topic, but we could have multiple of these, right? So we could also, in addition to our Hobbit updates data, which we have two partitions worth of data for, um, we may also have dwarf updates that's going along with that request. And this is going to change every time depending on which batch is ready to go uh, to be sent along to the broker. So I just wanted to give you a quick visualization of what this data actually looks like. All right, so we're going to take this request and we're going to ship it off to the broker and finally get out of Hobbiton and move on with our journey. All right, we've done the hard part. We've got Bilbo out of Hobbiton, which is, it takes a while, right? Now what? All right, so the request first lands on the server socket receive buffer. Okay, it's sort of landing zones for this incoming data. And here, this request is just going to be wait to be picked up by the network threads for processing you usually won't have to change any configuration at this point. There are some low level configurations if you're feeling wild. Um, you might want to talk with your operator about this too. Don't just do this for fun. Um, so if you want to tweak this, you can tweak the size of the receive buffer. Uh, you can also change the size, the max size of the request that can actually come in, right? So you're not bound by the uncompressed data, okay? But again, you probably won't need to change the defaults. Next. You know, the data is only going to hang out there for a very, very short amount of time. So next, after a short stay there, the data is going to be picked up by some available network thread from the pool of network threads. Um, and we're going to start getting it ready to be processed. So an important thing to note here is that whichever network thread picks up this request at this point, it's sort of going to follow it for the majority of this process moving forward. The first job of the network thread here is to just read the request from the socket receive buffer, decide what type of request it is, and put it on the request queue. Okay? And it's not just produce requests that are going to come in on this broker. We could have fetch requests, you know, requesting data be sent back to a consumer. Um, we have replication requests. We have more. It's not just produce requests. Okay? There are a couple you know, low-level configurations at this point in monitoring. So you'll want to monitor. Um, you can control the number of network threads, right? Generally, you won't have to change this. Um, the default is eight, but if you do want to, or sorry, the default is three. Um, and an upper bound for this is going to be the number of cores that you have on that server, right? And a good way to monitor this is using network processor average idle percent. The values range from zero, meaning that the threads are fully utilized, to one, meaning that the threads are, aren't busy at all, okay? And so the network thread has picked up that request. It's placed it on the request queue, okay? And it's just going to wait here for further processing by the server I.O. threads that are actually going to work to store this data on the broker, okay? At this point, you have control over the max size of the request queue with queued max requests and also queued max request bytes. So you can control just the number of requests or the size, the total size of those requests hanging out on the queue. A general rule of thumb is to set queued max requests to the number of active clients that you anticipate interacting with this broker. You may not know that, so maybe don't touch it, okay? Um, you don't want it to be larger than that because if you want strict ordering of your messages um, and you have this number be you know, 100,000 and you only have 10 clients, well, that's probably not good, right? You can have multiple requests from a single client hanging out on this queue. You can monitor the size of this request queue, as well as the amount of time that a request hangs out in this queue by using request queue size and request queue time MS. Um, these metrics together are a pretty good proxy for you know, how long your IO threads are actually taking, as well as if your broker is overwhelmed. Right? And these are important because if the request queue is full for any reason, we're going to block. Right? We can't add any more requests to it, and you're going to receive some for an exception. Okay? So um, 
maybe don't let it get full. Okay. Next, we have our IO threads. These are our MVPs. They're actually going to do the writing of the data to disk. Okay. Um, so they're going to pick up a request off of the request queue and start working with that data. These are also known as the request handler threads. Um, they're kind of used interchangeably, so keep that in mind. When the thread first accesses the request, the first thing it's going to do, you know, we've been working with raw writes this whole time, right? And so we want to validate this data just to make sure nothing has happened, you know, that we've maintained the integrity of this data. So we're going to do a cyclic redundancy check for fir you know, first things first. You can configure and monitor this at this point. So num IO threads, the default is eight. Um, you can change that. The max is just going to be, again, how many threads you have on that server. We also have request handler average idle percent. Again, you'll ideally want this to be closer to um, one to show that your threads are idle more often than not. A value closer to zero means that your threads are working overtime, right? They're working pretty hard. Finally, the moment that you're waiting for, right? We want to actually get the data onto Kafka, onto disk. Well, kind of, okay? We're not necessarily going to write to disk here. We're going to write to page cache, but stay with me here, okay? So if you, for those of you who use Kafka, if you'll recall, the underlying data structure of, of a Kafka topic is a log. It's a commit log, okay? And so this commit log is actually broken up into smaller components called segments. And each segment, in turn, has a couple of files that back it, okay? The first is the log file, where the actual event data is stored. The second is an index file, right? We want to know, um, you know every unique record is going to have an offset associated with it. And we want to know, um, you know efficiently how to skip in place in that topic to get access to that data. And so the index file is going to have fewer entries than the log file. It's just going to be an easy way for us to find data by offset. Then we have a similar file for time index. So same thing, but we're going to do a time-based offset to keep track of it. And this is great for disaster recovery situations for consumers. And then we have a snapshot file. So if you are uh, you've enabled item potency. You're going to be storing producer sequence numbers, um, and that's really handy here. OK. When the IO threads are writing these events, right, right, updating the log files, the index files, for efficiency, we're not writing to disk. Right? Writing to disk is expensive. So we're just going to write to page cache. And then later, it's going to be flushed to disk, right? Later. It's just, so for all intents and purposes, it's on disk, but you know, we've written it to page cache. That's good enough, right? Um, so, Rest assured, there are some configurations that you can play around with to make this process happen sooner rather than later. Like You can tweak how often we're flushing to disk. You can tweak how often we write to the index file or the time index, how often these files are rolled, how often um, you know, how we clean these things up. So check the docs for more specifics. Um, and know that you can actually make this more or less synchronous, that flushing to disk. So if that worries you, OK, you can still get that data on disk. Um, additionally, some of these configurations can be changed at the topic level. So this is at the broker level, but we can affect it at the topic level as well. A common one is the cleanup policy. So this was a value that we set when we created that topic in the beginning. Um, this can take two values, delete and compact. So a cleanup policy of delete basically says older entries by time are stale. And so we just want to clean those up. Um, how that happens is it could be a you know, talk on its own, um, but it'll effectively just clean up old data. Compact says, I want to store at least one value per key. So what it's going to do is it's going to go through, scan through the log and find older values for a key and clean those up at some point. Okay. All right, monitoring this. Okay, so the best way to monitor how your logs are flushing to disk is using the log flush rate and time MS. It's also important to know that this whole process of the IO threads actually writing this data to page cache um, is handled by another metric called local time MS. So how, mu how long the local broker that you are currently on takes to write this data, okay? From when the IO thread actually picks that data up off the request queue to when the data is written to page cache or you know, disk if you're setting it sort of synchronously. Okay. So we've made it to disk, effectively, kind of. Um, before we move on from the IO threads, um, how many of you have heard of tiered storage in Kafka? Not enough of you. Cool. It's a cool thing. You can offload some of your data to less expensive storage. That's wonderful. Um, the IO threads are going to handle that as well. The reason I'm not going to go into specifics here is that um, open source Kafka, we're almost ready to release this feature, I think, in the next version. Um, and there are other. Um, managed Kafka services that might have tiered storage enabled already. So just do some hand-waving here. It happens at this stage. OK, cool. So 
We want our IO threads to not be tied up. They've written the data, they're done. They want to hand off the request and move on with their lives. Okay? We want them to do the important thing. But we still need to replicate our data, right? Where does that happen? Okay, so to do that, the IO threads are going to move on. They're going to drop off the requ request in purgatory. That is actually what it's called. That is the technical term for where we put this request. Okay? Um, so purgatory is a map-like data structure based on a hierarchical timing wheel. I'm going to say that as though all of you know what that is. There are academic papers on that. Don't ask me about it. You can read it yourself. Uh, it's kind of cool. So basically, we're just going to let these requests hang out until the broker knows that we have fulfilled the acknowledgments configuration, right? Has this data actually been replicated? Okay? So we're not going to send a response back until we've actually fulfilled the acts. Okay? You can set this replication factor across the cluster if you want, using the default replication factor. You can also set it per topic, as we did in the beginning. Um, the data replication process is not actually triggered by this broker. It doesn't care. Okay. It is the job of the replicas to actually reach out and request that this data is copied over to them. All right. Don't worry, this happens um, at, at least every 500 milliseconds. Okay. So it's a pretty fast process. Um, and once the data has been successfully stored on those brokers, that's when we can pull the request off of Purgatory and start to build up a response object to send back to our producer. For monitoring at this, pro at this part, so we had local time MS, which is the amount of time it takes on the local broker to store the data. And then we have remote time MS, how long it takes for the replicas to actually get the data and successfully store it. All right, so that's what you're going to use to monitor this section. Um, note that this time interval actually factors into the overall time that the request takes from the producer perspective. That makes sense. And you're probably wondering why I'm saying that. Um, just wait, there's more. OK, so once we've actually stored the data on the other brokers, we can start to build up a response. So the broker is going to take that request out of purgatory, and it's going to build up this response object. In this case, it's a good one because the data was successfully stored. We cannot configure the response queue like we can the request queue, but overall, you can monitor it using similar metrics. Interestingly, the amount of time that a response hangs around on the response queue is not going to contribute to the overall time that a request takes from the producer perspective, from the metrics. Okay? It's weird. Keep that in mind. If you're looking into this, these times and they don't quite add up, that could be why. Okay. And now we have the handoff by the network threads. Okay? We're back to them. They've been handling it this whole time, but they, they want to be done. Okay? So the network thread that picked up that initial request, again, has been following this request and response the whole time. And now it's time for it to pick up that response from the response queue and send it back to the producer. And finally, this outgoing response is placed on the socket send buffer to await being received by this producer. Um, and in fact, the broker is going to wait until this full response is received by the producer before it moves on. OK. Um, we can affect the size of this using socket send buffer bytes if you'd like to. You probably won't have to change this. And the amount of time that it takes for the producer to actually receive this full response is handled with the response send time MS. This is factored into the overall time of, a response, of the request. Okay? And some final summer, a summary broker metrics. So we've received the response back to the producer client, and we're going to update these metrics, these time periods. So total time MS consists of the time that the request was spent on the the request queue, the local time writing that data to the broker, the remote time getting that data stored on the replicas, and the response send time MS. Response queue time MS is not factored into this overall value. Again, it's weird. Just let it be. OK. So we've made it to disk. We've made it back again. All right? That data has finally been stored. Wasn't that fun? And for you, it only takes like a second on a bad day okay, to get that data in. So um, again, this is more of an awareness talk. You know, The next time things don't quite go as planned, the next time you receive a weird exception or you run out of memory, I hope that you keep these configurations in mind. Okay? Um, and I hope that you don't hit those issues um, and you're smart about your batching moving forward. So again, appreciate the black box. Know that it's there for you. It's trying to extra extract all these away and make your life easier. And I know that we only really covered producers in the section. Um, surprise, the same thing happens with consumers, okay? uh, making a request for data to get it off of disk. Uh, we're going to build up a similar request, get that data. It's going to hang out in purgatory while we wait for data to actually be there for us to consume, and we're going to ship it back to the consumer. So 
same thing goes on there. And there's a number of other requests involved on the broker as well, but that's for another talk. Okay, so if you want to learn more about Kafka internals, um, we have a lot of resources up here. This is my link tree. Um, I've linked to Confluent Developer, which is our developer portal with more, uh, more courses and, and resources if you want to get into it. Um, so check that out. And I think I have like maybe 30 seconds for questions, but you can catch me later if you need to. So thank you so much. Yeah, thank you very much, Danica. Um, we are a little over time, but I think for one or two questions, it might be, it might be time. Yes. Cheater, you already know Kafka. Thank you. I just want to uh, just want to ask this um, logic that you talk about that is on a client. Is it exactly the same on all languages, or are there any differences? No, uh, the bulk of it is going to follow that exactly. Um, serializing can be a little bit different depending on the client that you're using. Um, the default partitioning logic is going to be different depending on the, so if you use the C++ or what's built on librd Kafka, that's going to have um, sort of the expected um, murmur2 hash, right? Um, and then like the Python client uses something different. So that definitely will factor into it. Um, there's too many different languages for me to cover all of them. Um, but yeah, if you are reaching some like pesky bug where the data isn't aligning like you think, I would encourage you to look into the actual client code and, and configure that. So Thank yeah, thanks for bringing that up. All right, any other, you have one more question? Uh, why is drinking not part of the Hobbit's activities? Why is drinking? Yeah, it says That's eating and smoking and all the other things, but it doesn't say drinking. And I can add that in. I think it was mostly a, mostly a, t a character count thing. Um, but yeah, I thought I was really clever adding thieving in there, but okay, I'll add drinking. <laughs> It's supposed to be a family-friendly conference, but that's cool. Yeah. Smoking pipe weed is fine. Yeah, that's fine. It's part of their culture, man. It's cool. I will update that for the next version of the talk. Thank you. All right, then. <laughs> Thank you very much, Danica. Let's yeah. give her a big hand. And Thank you.